The 2000 United States presidential election started off the same as any other. Bill Clinton was nearing the end of a successful second term. His vice president, Al Gore, was the near unanimous choice as the next Democratic candidate for office. Gore, a former senator from Tennessee, had helped the Clinton administration put the United States in an era of peace and economic prosperity. Public satisfaction with the country was widespread, as confidence in the economy was high, and no major issues weighed down on the minds of the American public. The situation was similar to the 1996 U.S. presidential election, in which many voters saw no reason not to vote for the incumbent president. However, the 1998 Clinton-Lewinsky scandal had tarnished the achievements of the administration. Gore, for his part, attempted to distance his campaign from his relationship with Clinton. Viewed as a moderate Democrat, Gore's future-focused agenda resonated well with voters who prioritized health care, social insurance and security, and education. George Walker Bush became the Republican Party nominee for president after beating out several other candidates, most notably John McCain. Bush heralded from a family of politicians. His father, George H.W. Bush, had served as both vice president and as the 41st president, while his younger brother Jeb was the governor of Florida at the time. Bush, the governor of Texas, was viewed as a more conservative Republican nominee and held significantly less experience on international issues than his Democratic opponent. To counter his professional shortcomings, Bush tried to connect with citizens and portray himself as affable and engaging. Meanwhile, his campaign tried to portray Gore as rude, wooden, and prone to exaggeration. In September of 1999, Bush enjoyed a robust 20% lead nationally. As the media began to focus on Bush and his proposed policy and resume were critiqued, his lead began to decline. In January of 2000, Bush's lead had been reduced to 11%. By June, polls showed Bush leading only 48% to 44%. Gore, as an established national politician, saw much less volatility in his ratings. Notably, several minor political parties were also fielding candidates. Among them were Ralph Nader of the Green Party and Pat Buchanan of the Reform Party. A Gallup poll ominously foreshadowed, even if the nominees of these parties don't win the election, such third-party candidacies can impact the outcome of the election by disproportionately drawing votes away from one or the other major party candidates. By late October, both the Democratic and Republican campaigns felt good about their chances of taking the White House. Each candidate watched the election unfold from their home states. Bush took up residence in the governor's mansion in Austin. Gore observed from the Lowe's Vanderbilt Hotel in Nashville. Almost immediately, problems arose. Ron Klain, Gore's chief of staff, recounted getting calls from lawyers around 9 a.m. Eastern, saying people in Palm Beach, Florida, were confused about who they had voted for. At the time, Klain made note of the situation, but in the end, did not think one county was too much of a concern. By the late evening, polls showed the race extremely close. Although some swing states, such as Wisconsin, Iowa, New Mexico, and Oregon reported close numbers, none of them necessitated a recount. Florida, on the other hand, quickly became the main focus of the election. Carrying 25 electoral votes, Florida alone would tip the election in favor of whoever won the state. Uh, now project an important win for Vice President Al Gore. NBC News projects that he wins the 25 electoral votes in the state of Florida. Just before 8 p.m. Eastern, most major news networks projected Gore to win Florida, and thus the entire election. These projections, however, were largely based off an oversampling of groups that inclined to vote Democratic. Florida also lies in two time zones. The Panhandle, which tended to be more conservative friendly, had yet to report. Before long, the networks had put Florida back in the undecided column. What the networks give us, the networks taketh away. NBC News is now taking Florida out of Vice President Gore's column and putting it back in the too close to call column. As midnight struck the East Coast, a winner had still yet to be decided. Just after 2 a.m. Eastern, news networks declared Florida in favor of Bush. George Bush is the president-elect of the United States. He has won the state of Florida, according to our projections. Gore called Bush to concede. Within the hour, however, Gore rescinded his concession, citing dramatic changes in the circumstances. Reasons for Al Gore's delay, this is according to some of his low-level staffers, is that he has actually called George W. Bush and taken back his concession phone call. Carl Rove, a Bush aide, remembers watching Bush's lead in Florida drop from nearly 40,000 at 2.48 a.m. 
to 11,000 12 minutes later at 3 a.m. As more votes from Palm Beach County arrived, the lead dwindled to around 1,800 votes. Confusion and exasperation was beginning to build on both sides, from news anchors to campaign aides to those watching at home. Mm -hmm. Let's just we'll find, find out what? that Florida has gone from too close to call mm -hmm. to Gore, to clu too, too close, close to call to Bush, to too close to call. I suppose Nader can have some hopes that he might carry Florida in about a day or two. And but that this is truly amazing. In the early morning hours, Florida Secretary of State Catherine Harris, an ally of Jeb Bush, legally certified the winner of the state election as George W. Bush. As a mandatory machine recount reduced Bush's lead to a mere 327 votes, lawyers from both campaigns descended upon Tallahassee. In the dark early morning hours of Wednesday, November 8th, 2000, both campaigns rushed to Florida to protest or defend the initial declaration of a Bush victory. With the states being the presidency, and the margin being just 327 votes, any oddity was given national attention. Carl Koch, a gore summarized the momentous project ahead. The Bush argument was easier than our argument. The votes had been cast. It's over. We had to make the argument for why the election wasn't over, and the people don't want to hear that argument. Although Gore's slogan was count all the votes. Only four of Florida's 67 counties were selected for a recount. Broward, Miami-Dade, Palm Beach, and Volusia. These counties typically voted heavily Democratic and not 24 hours before had been the epicenter of voter confusion. While Gore dove headfirst into leading the recounts, the Bush brothers took a hands-off approach. Each ballot, manually counted, was overseen by a neutral monitor as well as Bush and Gore aide. Ballots with hanging chads where the ballot was punched but the paper had not attached, or pregnant chads, where the ballot had been punched but not all the way through, caused the most consternation. Both could have been misread by a machine, thus the necessity to recount by hand. Any ballot that received an objection was tossed in a canvassing board pile for review. On November 15th, eight days after election day, Harris announced no further votes from the hand recounts would be accepted. At this time, according to the Associated Press, Bush's lead stood at 286 votes. However, a failed attempt by Gore to exclude absentee ballots arriving late from overseas increased Bush's lead to 930. Six days later, on November 21st, the Florida Supreme Court decided unanimously that hand recounts should resume, giving each county until November 26th to finish the counts. However, the next day, a group of Bush volunteers, mostly lawyers from out of state, gathered outside an office building conducting the recounts for Miami-Dade County. A miscommunication involving a training ballot, possibly deliberate, between the chair of the Miami-Dade Democratic Party and a Bush volunteer, prompted the crowd into a frenzy. The Brooks Brothers riot, an ensuing pandemonium over the stolen ballot, grounded the recount in Miami-Dade to a halt. 17 days after Election Day, on November 24th, the United States Supreme Court reviewed the Florida Supreme Court ruling in favor of Gore the recounts could continue. Two days later, on November 26th, Harris certified that Bush's lead stood at 537. However, Palm Beach County results arrived two hours late and were excluded from the count, and Miami-Dade recounts had not resumed since the Brooks Brothers riot. On the 1st of December, each campaign argued their case before the U.S. Supreme Court to extend or suspend the recounts. Monday, December 4th, saw the U.S. Supreme Court rule 9-0 to vacate the previous Florida Supreme Court ruling and asked the Florida Supreme Court to clarify its argument for allowing the recount to continue in their November 21st ruling. The Gore campaign saw this as a victory as they thought the Florida Supreme Court would respond quickly and persuasively. However, the Florida Supreme Court did almost nothing, ignoring the request from the US Supreme Court. This reflected the Bush campaign's argument that the November 21st ruling to continue the vote was capricious, arbitrary, and inconsistent. Instead of responding to the U.S. Supreme Court, the Florida Supreme Court defiantly voted 4-3 to order a statewide recount of some 60,000 ballots the machines had rejected. The U.S. Supreme Court issued a stay, 5-4, halting the recount. This, in effect, handed George W. Bush the national election. The following Wednesday, December 13th, 36 days after Election Day, Gore conceded defeat. Over the library of one of our great law schools is inscribed the motto, not under man, but under God and law. 
That's the ruling principle of American freedom, the source of our democratic liberties. I've tried to make it my guide throughout this contest, as it has guided America's deliberations of all the complex issues of the past five weeks. Now the U.S. Supreme Court has spoken. Let there be no doubt, while I strongly disagree with the Court's decision, I accept it. I accept the finality of this outcome, which will be ratified next Monday in the Electoral College. And tonight, for the sake of our unity as a people and the strength of our democracy, I offer my concession. For the first time since 1888, a president-elect would be sworn into office having received the minority of the popular vote. Bush lost the popular vote by 543,895 votes, amounting to one half percent of votes cast. The Electoral College then came under immediate and intense scrutiny, lasting even today. Could Gore, who won the popular vote, had been victorious without the Electoral College? A study done by analytics website 538 reached an ambiguous conclusion. While impossible to say for sure, it is known that candidates allocate their funds in order to get the best results in the Electoral College system. Nate Silver, editor-in-chief, asserts, the optimal strategy for winning the Electoral College, of course, is probably suboptimal for maximizing one's popular vote. Bush, who was regarded to have had more campaign resources than Gore, could have redirected his funds in a different manner had the goal simply been to win the most votes. The better question might be then, was the Electoral College the only reason that Gore lost? The impact of the third party candidates is undeniable. Ralph Nader, placing third, won 3% of the popular vote, but drew disproportionately from voters that would have voted Democratic. Nader's conservative counterpart, Pat Buchanan, had little effect on Bush's voting numbers. Buchanan may, however, have indirectly altered the outcome of the election. Palm Beach County, the location where voters had exited, unsure of who they had voted for, noticed an odd spike in Buchanan votes. Palm Beach County tends to vote heavily Democratic, and an in-depth study of Buchanan's performance, published in the American Political Science Review, found that he received more than 3,400 votes, 2,800 more than his original projection of around 600. This 567% increase in projected votes occurred in no other county in the country for Buchanan. The culprit? The butterfly ballot, used only in Palm Beach County. The way that the ballot is laid out could be confusing. If only read on the left side, the first two notches seem to correspond to Bush and then to Gore. However, when looking at the right side as well, it becomes clear that anyone who punched the second hole would have indeed voted for Buchanan. Some 20,000 ballots had two holes punched, one for Gore and one for Buchanan. After punching the hole, punching again would invalidate the ballot. Because Bush was listed first and his hole was at the top, there was no way of confusing a vote for him, and the ballot was thus only detrimental to Gore. The evidence does seem to incriminate the butterfly ballot. Democratic voters, as measured by those who voted for Democrats in the 2000 U.S. Senate election who voted on election day, were significantly more likely to support Buchanan than those Democratic voters who used absentee ballots, which did not utilize butterfly ballots. Similarly, the unusually high level of support for Buchanan was concentrated in precincts with high levels of support for Democratic candidates for other offices. The major question immediately after Gore conceded was, if the recount had continued, would Gore have eventually won? Two studies, done by the Miami Herald with USA Today and by a news consortium led by the New York Times, Washington Post, and the University of Chicago, both came to similar conclusions. Had the recount continued in its current form, only in four counties, then Bush likely would have still won. However, had a full state recount been done using an inclusive standard, Gore may have won. In reality, we will probably never know for sure. The 2000 U.S. presidential election was one of the closest and most disputed in the history of the country. The controversial manner in which Bush gained the helm of the most powerful office on earth deepened political rivalries, and increased public skepticism in the nation's electoral and judicial institutions. The Supreme Court had gotten involved in everyday politics in a manner that was perceived as heavily partisan and somewhat contradictory. This is highlighted by NPR reporter Nina Totenberg, who pointed out that the five conservative justices were protectors of states' rights, yet in this case they went for a federal decision that essentially rejected states' rights. Conversely, the four liberals 
were often not big supporters of states' rights, but here were big supporters. Consequently, in a dissent from the 5-4 U.S. Supreme Court ruling to stop the recount, Justice John Paul Stevens famously wrote, Although we may never know with complete certainty the identity of the winner of this year's presidential election, the identity of the loser is perfectly clear. It is the nation's confidence in the judge as an impartial guardian of the rule of law. As the courts began the long process of repairing their public image, President-elect Bush and Vice President-elect Dick Cheney would attempt to guide the nation into the 21st century. However, just seven months into his first term, the controversy surrounding the president's election would take a backseat to the terrorist attacks of September 11th and the ensuing global war on terror that would come to dominate politics for the duration of Bush's time in office. If you guys enjoyed the video and found that helpful, please don't forget to like and subscribe. It goes a long way in helping me build the channel. Thanks a lot, guys, and I'll see you in the next one.